Welcome to Canon Calls. I'm your host, Jake McAtee, and this week my guest is David Regeer of the Church Curmudgeon fame. You've probably seen his puns and other various and sundry crimes as you scroll through Twitter. We chat about the Twitter world, Benny Hinn, and Psalmody in the worship service. If you enjoy the interview or you're already a fan, pick up his book, Then Tweets My Soul, at canonpress.com. I will say before we begin that it might sound like we performed this interview outdoors as there is what sounds to be a parakeet in the background offering insight as we go. I didn't really notice it while we recorded, but I certainly did as we edited the show. So second episode into 2020 and Birdgate hits us. So without further ado, meet David Regeer. David Regeer. Good morning. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Good. Where are you exactly? Southern California, yes. Awesome. So I feel like that's a, uh, a maybe a tough gig for uh, a curmudgeon. You got to like really work uh, up a curmudgeonly thing. No, we, we, we have plenty to complain about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the church curmudgeon, I believe I looked at your Twitter and I believe it was started in November of 2010. That is correct. I'm coming up on 10 years now. That's wild. So how yeah. long was it before that thing really got out of hand? Well, I don't know. I mean... I, I remember like when I hit like 400 followers and I thought, this is crazy. I can't believe that 400 people would be listening to me complain, you know, just with my jokes. But uh, and that was like in the first yeah six or seven months or something like that. But in the first year, it really did start to take off. Wow. OK. So. Now, it seems perfect because evangelicals tend to be a self-serious group at times. Yes. And so looking around, were you just like, there's a lot of material to work with here? There were a couple of other Anon accounts. It wasn't a big thing right? Uh, then like it is now, but there were a couple of others like uh, some celebrity worship pastors and, and, uh, and, and pastors and things like that. And I said, you know, we really need to hear from the old guy on the back row who's complaining about everything. <laughs> And I've been in uh, ministry now for uh, 20 some years. And so I've known a lot of those guys. And uh, honestly, they're really funny. Absolutely. So before you had this outlet, so let's say in 2009, yeah. these thoughts yeah. that are racing through your mind, are these things that just you muttered under your breath? Or what did you do with this content before? Well, <laughs> sometimes those kind of things would get me in trouble in staff meetings. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I, uh, j just little quips and mouthing off a little bit here and there, and uh, driving my wife crazy with uh, with little jokes. Sure. But uh, all all of my kids have picked up on the puns and stuff like that, so it's something that's just part of our lives. But uh, this does give me definitely a creative outlet uh, with it. So, as far as the just the different tools in your tool belt, how would yeah. you would you rate puns? Or is that the most criminal thing you do? Do you think? Yeah, I, I would say that that's uh, that's there. I think my my little bad poetry and my coffee poetry <laughs> ranks in there as well. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I think those are probably the most egregious things right there. Yeah, I think it is important to have a robust theology of sins and crimes. And while I, you know, I don't think you have to confess, I do think they are criminal. Um, <laughs> Guilty. Do you remember the tweet that really got away from you that just went bananas, the first one? I think the first one that, that really blew my mind was, um, I mean, if you've been following me for a long time, you know that, uh, that with the time change in fall, um, I call that Benny Hinn Day, uh, and everybody fall back. And uh, that was the first one that I remember. I uh, it was an early Sunday morning, and I was getting ready for church, and so I just tossed it in there. Um, and I I got out of the shower, and I had uh, I mean something like a hundred retweets on it. Wow. Um, and that was when I, I mean, I don't remember how many followers I had. It was somewhere in, I, I think it was below 10,000 followers at that point still, uh, maybe even around a thousand followers or something like that, but it was blowing up and I got 
uh, that that one was kind of boggled my mind. How many people responded to that one? You just thought this is uh, I can do this. Yeah, well, it uh, you know it, it, it Twitter is one of those things that that uh, feeds on your uh, you know your your love of, uh, of 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 getting pats on the back. So <laughs> yeah, it does seem to subsidize some odd things. Yeah, if we were to have a summit of sorts of of Christian big Twitter accounts, yeah, I think you'd be invited. It would be fun. <laughs> You said you're coming up on 10 years. What have you learned about Twitter over 10 years? And this doesn't have to be, I'm not asking for a yeah. super spiritual thing, but what have you seen over 10 years? What, what kind of oscillations have happened? Well, I think uh, like uh, it, it was actually the most fun up through about 2015. Okay. Um, and since then, I mean, uh, it has, uh, it, it's gotten a little bit more raucous and, uh, and, uh, especially with all of the political stuff, people tend, uh, to, to get keyed up just a little bit more or a lot more than they used to. And, uh, and, and it's not as much fun as it used to be. <laughs> yeah. I'm there for the fun. I'm there to, to like put in the fun to be the, uh, uh, some of the comic relief and all of that. Um, you know, I, I, I do some of the satire and and parody in there um but uh but but i do just want to be some some relief maybe maybe poke a few ribs here and there but uh but it was it was a lot of fun through you know through about 2015 or so and then people just started to to um, polarize a little bit it really did take a turn right about there i graduated yeah. college in 16 and it just seems like from that moment on it was it was it was a no fun place to be And I talked with the Babylon Bee guys not too long Mm -hmm. ago, and just uh, what's been refreshing about them, and I think you represent this as well, is it's not even, it's not that you don't have a viewpoint. I'm sure, you know, David Regeer has opinions and thoughts. Yes. But they're not communicated in a shrill way. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and that's kind of been my whole MO. Um, I... uh, I have, I made a decision early on that I wasn't going to be too political um, just because I had followers from all over the spectrum. And I wanted it to be a place where there wouldn't really be anybody who who wouldn't want to just talk to me. I mean, obviously, I have some strong convictions about all of these things. But as far as, you know, this is a character and he's got a, a, a broad range of people he can talk to. And I'd rather be able to talk to the people uh, than shut them down. I wonder, how, how soon did you have to decide? You know, it may be my naivete at around 2010, 11, 12. Yeah. But did you even have to have that conversation with yourself about, like, what I'm going to stay out of? Well, a little bit. I mean, uh, during that presidential administration, right. there was a lot of opposition uh, and uh, uh, to... Um, uh, to a lot of the things that uh, that that I believe in, and uh, and 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 I would uh, stand up for those things, but not in a way that pokes direct fun, you know, or, or not. Well, I wouldn't say fun. Uh, that 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 uh, that polarizes, but it is just a way to, to to have people listen. And I stayed pretty much out of the political end of it anyway. Yeah. Uh, it was it was in the first couple of years when it uh, you know when I was taking off and I realized man there are some diverse people <laughs> uh, theologically politically uh, that are following me and uh, and and I'm touching something that they that they want to hear in in all of this and so so I'm going to stay there with this. It is an odd thing as you said you've been in the ministry so you know as you look around the evangelical playground of sorts yeah. and to find that you know notifications on your phone hey this big pastor's following yeah yeah all of a sudden that was uh i remember there was one sunday um that uh there was a a, a mega church pastor that apparently between services he discovered my twitter feed and he just started uh retweeting uh just about everything i had ever written this <laughs> isn't in the first year and a half and uh, and and he just said, I, I just found this guy and I'm dying. And he had, you know, I, I think it was a it was in a college town. So he had a lot of students and stuff like that. And and uh, I, I mean, I it was one of those things. I think I gained a, a thousand or more followers that day. Wow. 
And, uh, and so, you know, you realize, wow, so, you know, somebody's, somebody thinks that this is good. <laughs> what is the spectrum as far as, uh, you mentioned that you had just the curmudgeon has a wide theological spectrum of followers. Yeah. I'd be curious, like, what's a, is it, you mentioned Benny Hinn. Is it like somebody from like Benny Hinn all the way to the dark end of the dark end? I don't. Oh yeah. I, I well, I mean, there are some people, that, you know, over the course of time that I think genuinely thought that I was uh, that that I was doing it in an honestly mean spirited or uh, a way to tear down the church. There's there's wow. people out yeah. there, like you know, genuine a- atheists out there, from there to Rick oh, yeah. Warren and Andy Stanley, um, you know. Like huge mega church guys. Um, I don't think Joel Osteen ever followed me. Uh, <laughs> He's probably heard of you. But, uh, um, well, yeah, I, th- I think his wife did actually follow me for a little while and then blocked me. Oh, no. uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, okay, too funny. Now, as we mentioned, David Regeer, we broke out a little bit there, but it is Regeer, not Regeer. That's or, correct. Uh, Reggie, I bet it gets weird. Um, yeah, yeah, I've, I've been. Uh, Waiting uh, for my seat at a restaurant, I get some interesting things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you're a minister in California. Minister of music, yes. Okay. As a music minister, one thing I, I started following your personal account not too long ago, um, as we've had conversations, your Church Curmudgeon book, as we should mention, available yes. anywhere you can get a book, most importantly, Amazon, canonpress.com. How is your, I mean, obviously they were probably the first to know that's you um, yes. tweeting, but has it been an odd thing as people follow the the line a little bit and end up on your personal account? Yeah, there, there were, yeah. Once I, once I put out the book, I mean, I, uh, I figured that more people would, would kind of make the connection there and I haven't been completely uh, anonymous about it. I, I, I think I, I mean, I came out to, uh, okay, that's great language coming out. Uh, <laughs> uh, I started telling my friends uh, somewhere somewhere in the first year or two. I started telling people that that, that was me, and I uh, and since then I haven't been really hiding the connection there. Sure. Uh, um, obviously, yeah. When the when the when the book came out and my name is on the cover, right. um, some people you know they they made the connection there, and then but there are still people who um who think I'm somewhat anonymous, and I'm really not <laughs> right, and it's not just your anon account that has made me laugh. It was not too long ago an electric tweet about your kids possibly leaving on a light bulb that's been on for a hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah, know, the, you know, uh, I'm a dad. We turn off lights. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some light bulb that's just been on for a hundred years, I guess. Yeah, and yeah, uh, you mentioned that it was probably your kids that left it. Yeah, it's probably my kids. <laughs> um, so another thing that I I really wanted to talk to you about is your interest in psalmody as a music minister. Yes, can you tell me about that? How did that start? Well. Uh... It's it's interesting. I mean, over the the past the the, the course of the past uh, ten years, um, I mean, obviously, I uh, as a as a minister of music, worship leader, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, you 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 have to know the psalms. Um, and I've and I've I've loved the psalms. I've been writing uh, music from the psalms, uh, referencing the psalms, uh, ever since I started writing music um, back in. Uh, 1996 or so. Okay. Um, I've 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 written uh, worship music, praise music that uh, that that references the Psalms. Uh, over the course of the past 10 years, um, I started uh, it, as I started working more with choirs. I started to do some more choral work. I learned about uh, through composed Psalms, where you're just taking the words of the Scripture and putting it to music. And I said. You know, I mean, I I I, re- I remember uh, waking up one morning, and saying, and and I just uh, started uh, writing from Psalm 98, of sing to the Lord a new song, and uh, and and I brought that to my choir, and it was and it was just amazing how well it was received, and so I started writing. I I think I wrote uh, seven or eight more through composed psalms for for my choir at the church that I was at at that point. 
and uh, and the church received it really well. And uh, so, uh, but then I ended up uh, taking another position where I am now at First Baptist in San Jacinto, California. And uh, uh, a, a few years back, um, I was at a, a, a conference and uh, Ligon Duncan was speaking on the Psalms in worship and just talking about how we need to, to sing as a church um, the whole thing. You know, the, the, the Psalms are there for us. And I had realized, you know, that there, there are churches that do this. There are churches that, uh, that sing from the Psalter. Their hymn book is the Psalter. I knew a little bit about metric psalms and things like that, but I hadn't really looked into it. But as uh, Ligon Duncan was talking, uh, it popped into my head that um, that if I wanted my church to start singing the psalms like this, I had to put it to melodies that they knew. Um, I can't teach my church 150 new tunes. <laughs> um, I mean. We have we have a broad spectrum of people, but you know I've got I've got a lot of older folks in my in, in, in this church, and they they can't just learn that many new tunes. But what I can do is I can take hymn tunes that they know and put the psalms to them. And and I uh, I mean the light bulb just went off in my head that uh, if I'm going to do this in our church, that's the way I'm going to have to do it. Um, I'm not going to uh, buy a new hymn book for them. I'm going to write one. Okay. And so from that point, I started uh, putting a psalm a week to meter. Okay. And uh, I took, I took uh, one psalm every week. The first one that I did was Psalm 6. Uh, and uh, uh, Lord, rebuke me not in anger. And, uh, and I put it to the tune of uh, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Okay. And I discovered that if my... Uh, my congregation knew the tune, they could sing whatever words that I put on the screen. Right. And I put the words on the screen. And I told them, this is what we're doing. This is, this is the tune that we're going to sing. Um, but I want you to sing this psalm that's on the screen. We're going to sing the whole psalm. And you're going to sing some things that you've never sung before. Uh, but uh, from the first bars, they knew how to sing it and they responded in an amazing way for an aging Baptist congregation. It's blown my mind. <laughs> yeah. So tell me about that in terms of like the transition. Have you seen anything? You changed the diet a bit. What, what's kind of come from that? Well, one thing that I've, that I've noticed is that, uh, that it has uh, broadened people's understanding of what you are able to sing in worship. <laughs> You don't have it, it's not all praise. Uh, it's not all uh, uh, I mean, obviously, a lot of praise and worship songs use the length or they, they use the language of the psalms, but they use the comfortable things. They don't talk about um, the kind of repentance that the psalms talk about often. They don't talk about um, the, the, the trouble. They don't talk about how your friends have betrayed you mm. very much. But the psalms do. And I mean, they don't, they definitely don't talk about, you know, um, the king of heaven uh, putting to death his enemies by the sword to be eaten by jackals. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard, but, you know, I haven't heard that one either. Yeah, but, but, uh, uh, but you can sing things like that. Giving that to the congregation, it opened their eyes to a broader conception of who God is. So. Yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting, you know, I, it's from the theological spectrum growing up that I've traveled along and then ending up here in Moscow, where we are one of those churches that has the Psalter um, yes. as a hymn book. I have, I'd never had that as something that this is going to be every Sunday. Yeah. Um, and it has been the coolest thing um, and something I thought it, it would not have been uh, attractive to me at all a number of years ago, or it's just not very... Uh, <laughs> well, and it's it's, it's the strangest I mean, very thing. Honestly, that you know, you 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 go to YouTube, you go to some places, and you you hear how some churches do it, and some of them, it does sound just dead and old and dusty, old and dusty, and and they sing things really slowly. Um, and I don't want to knock anybody who does that, uh, does it the way that their fellowship does it, because I know that. 
uh, that there are a lot of ways, different ways of doing church. And I know that God edifies people through his word in, in those churches. Uh, but that wouldn't work in my congregation at all if we're to just sing them slow and dead. But we can do it if we, if we sing them to tunes that, that our church knows and uh, would respond to anyway. Sure. And even just learning, you know, that's their Bible. And so yeah. they, you, you, your congregation is, is putting to song and putting in their hearts the text, which is yes. kind of the goal. Yeah, it's God's Word. And I've, uh, I've, I've always believed uh, through ministry that the, the most powerful and the most effective uh, uh, means of communication uh, and edification in the congregation is God's Word unadorned. Hmm. Definitely. Definitely. It is, it is an odd thing, is, is the more that I've, I've come to enjoy and, and loved singing the Psalms. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> I've always thought about it, you know, it'd be like if somebody just used something else f- instead of preaching from the text, you know, they were thought, they thought yeah. we're going to preach through Calvin's Institutes today, which would be, you know, Calvin's awesome. And generally everybody likes Calvin, but it'd be, it would be weird. It would yeah, be exactly. Weird. Exactly. So how long ago did you start doing that? You mentioned? Uh, I, I started that about two and a half years ago. Uh, you said you were adding one new psalm a week, so how- yeah, I have slowed down from that pace because I've gotten through a lot of the short ones. Okay. <laughs> um, so you're coming up on Psalm 119, is what you're telling me. Actually, I've, uh, Psalm 119 was easy uh, because it's already split into 22 parts, and so uh, uh, and each of those parts is eight verses, which makes for a nice short thought of its own. I mean, each one of those sections is a thought of its own. And uh, and works itself out into. Um, we will often do a, a section of Psalm 119 before the message because it's all about receiving God's word. But uh, so so that part was easy. But uh, you have things like Psalm 106, which starts out as a great psalm of praise, and then you uh, then they start rehearsing all of the sins of Israel for I don't know 50 or 60 verses. It's it's a little bit uh, difficult to 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 work those out into to things that are easily singable by a congregation. Right. When you're talking, I mean, you're naming names and, and, uh, and talking about who was swallowed up by the earth. Uh, <laughs> as you do, um, as you do, as, as you do. So, so you have to split those up into, into some sections and some, and, and some different songs, but, uh, uh, it, uh, I, I've slowed down my pace considerably, but, uh, but I am still working, uh, towards a goal. Of getting them all done. What's been the biggest hit with your congregation? Is there a psalm that that folks asked for on repeat? I, I would say um, of of the ones that we have, uh, I, uh, Psalm eight is, has been. Uh, I mean, that's such a, a powerful psalm anyway. But Psalm eight, uh, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, uh, has has been uh, one that they've really grabbed onto. Another one that they love to sing is Psalm 46, God is our refuge and our strength. And I, I put it to the tune of Sweet Hour of Prayer. And boy, the, the, the church just sings out on that one. I mean, honestly, any, any one that I put to, uh, to a good tune that they know, they'll, they'll just sing it out. That's awesome. Now, you mentioned some of the Kickstarter was sort of listening to Duncan's sermon. Yeah, uh, or message. If you have a congregant that's just curious about this and why you're doing it, do you send them anywhere? What What do you recommend to, to folks who this is totally new? First thing I do is I just talk to them about it, and um, I mean there are uh, there are a number of uh, of good salters out there. I know Canon Press has has put out the the, the Cantus Christi and and uh, and. Uh, and some good resources. Crown and Covenant has a good uh, uh, a good psalter that actually I, I I mean I have that one on my iPad. Okay. But mostly what I've been doing is uh, since I you know this has been a project that for me at least initially is for the local church is it's for uh, for our congregation and uh, that's why I've just been kind of. Uh, uh, doing it without too much outside input from looking at other psalm sources, uh, just because I, you know, I've, I've always been a kind of a do-it-yourselfer sure. with all of that stuff. 
And, uh, and, you know, since this is for the local church, I mean, I do have people telling me on a regular basis saying, you know, this has been done before. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I know. Um, You're a Baptist of, at heart. And... I'm a Baptist at heart. <laughs> so. Well, it's been so encouraging to see from over there. And, and like I said, I, you know, if you ordered Baptist right off the menu, I, it's not what I would expect. And so do you feel that? Do you feel like you're kind of, you know, breaking well, ground there? Yeah, I, I mean, as far as, uh, as as doing this this thing in our church um, and being something that's that's just different, yeah, it's um, I, I I didn't grow up Baptist. I actually grew up Mennonite. Wow. Uh, and I've I've been kind of all over the place uh, as far as uh, being in different churches. But we're supposed to let the gospel uh, dwell in us richly with all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual psalm songs, and uh, and we've been short on doing that. And so I figured the best way to do that was to do it literally. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you're right. Of course, that's obviously not a denomination specific. It doesn't have to be a denomination specific yeah. thing. I do think, though, that the next book, The Church Curmudgeon Rights, has got to be your story from Mennonite to where you are now. I mean, I think that's got to be. Oh, like, wow. The thriller you know, I, of the- <laughs> wow, that could be a good one. My spiritual memoir. I'm sure it's got to be interesting. That's got to be another episode, I think. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll have to see. So last question I have for you. With uh, with the church curmudgeon, Tolkien once said when he started writing, as he tugged, it came. Uh, all of that <laughs> stuff was in the leaf fold of his mind. And what do you have a favorite? Um, like right now, I am I am working through a lot of Bill Larson. Okay. With the Far Side comics. What is your top recommend of that world? Is it Bill Watterson with Calvin and Hobbes? Who is it? Oh, uh well, okay, definitely all of those are uh, uh are in in the mix of stuff that um you know, that 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 that's what helped build me um <laughs> in the realm of hu- humor. Sure. Uh Woodhouse and Woodhouse. uh um, Saki, uh, H. H. Monroe, uh, was in there just for their, their powers of observation and, and, and the dry wit, uh, Dave Barry, uh, with, uh, I used, I mean, in the paper, I used to read his weekly column and it just, uh, had so much, uh, wealth of, of just great witty observation. And those are all things that, uh, that helped uh, you know, make me what I am today, I guess. <laughs> I love it. I grew up with my TV, so I, I've been having to go back and just gain all of these comics. I feel like other guys in the office are like, of course, we grew up with those. And it's like, man, well, exactly, yeah. Happen. Anyway, thank you so much for your time. And we will chat soon about this, this Mennonite journey. All right. Thanks very much. <laughs> thanks, David. Hey, take care, Jake.